Recovery is stupendous. Achievable. Hope. Freedom. 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 Empowering. It's unique to everyone. It's a journey, not a destination. Getting a new lease on life. It's finding restoration after you fall down. Recovery is having the freedom to enjoy life. For me, it was finding a way to really love myself. My recovery is possible in part because of my own sense of purpose. Hello, and welcome to Montana's Peer Network Recovery Talks podcast. We, of course, are on Facebook live today. I'm Jim Haney. Uh, Bill Devil. Welcome. Thanks so much for tuning in to another episode. Today's topic is kind of a special one, I think, right, Bill, for both of us? Yeah. We thought we would share how we got involved with peer support. I think this is a common question that I know with like peer support 101 training, people ask, like they, they'll they ask, like they want to know, how did you get involved? So Bill, how did you get involved with, you know, being a, being a peer supporter? We'll probably go back and forth together a little bit, but I want to say thank you to my mentor all the way back in 2008. Um, her name was Catherine Hawks Bryson. She was a peer supporter at the agency that I was court ordered to get mental health treatment at. And I had no idea when I started receiving services and started interacting with her on a biweekly basis that I would someday be be able to provide services and, and be a support. The agency which I received my mental health services at had some programs available in it that developed peer supporters. And I don't know, I was maybe six to eight months into my mental health recovery. And I'm thinking about it. And and I am at this time just starting to accept the diagnosis that I was given. Becoming a peer supporter was the farthest thing from my mind. I'm I'm just trying to digest what this means to me. What do I do about it? Do I have a life anymore? Or am I just going to collect an SSDI check for the rest of my life? It was a lot to, uh, to process. So, so my development into becoming a peer supporter happened over a period of time. But I can, I can tell you this. Um, I wrote a little article for The Pulse this week. And it was people that saw something in me that I was totally unaware of, totally unaware of, didn't know how to believe in myself. They believed in me. They encouraged me. And it took another 18 months before I took the peer supporter class that they offered there. I don't know if you want to jump in and then I can come back to my my story, but that's kind of how the beginning of that all happened. Yeah. Yeah. I mine's like in two two pieces. So there's the piece around how I started working as a peer supporter. And then the other part of when I first got introduced to peer support was I was in a psychiatric hospital and there was a guy who volunteered. And this is back in the 90s. And he, I don't think his title was peer support. I think he was just a volunteer, but he said to me, you know, I'm, I'm like you, you know, and that was, that was, that was, that changed my universe and began to open, open me up because he was sharing his experience and how he got better. And here I was in the hospital. So that was where I first met, you know, peer support, even though at the time it wasn't like, Hey, I'm a peer supporter, but for me, it wasn't, you know, it was years and years later. Um, in uh, 2008, and I applied at the mental health center for a position. They were opening a drop-in center. And so they were looking for a peer supporter, somebody in recovery from co-occurring, that kind of thing. So just based on that experience, you know, that I'd had, and that was 14 years before, a long time had passed, and I never had any intention of being a peer supporter. That was not but what but what struck me when I reached my 10 year uh, anniversary for recovery, I started to feel that urge to want to give back. 
And so I did, I did talk, a couple talks, shared my story at a treatment center, you know, and so that had sort of been on my mind for a while. And then anyway, and then I seen this ad and I thought, oh, peer support, maybe I could go do this part-time. <laughs> now, little did I know <laughs> that, that that little part, part-time thing um, would become the next, you know, what are we, um, 12 years later, um, this is like my whole life, right, is, you know, leads me to, you know, the drop-in center and build MPN and, you know, all this stuff. But yeah, I mean, that's how I, and I didn't either. And I, I mean, when I look at it, I think peer support kind of picked me, not, not the other way around. I didn't go out like, hey, I'm going to go be a peer supporter. Let me go to training. You know, it was like, it just sort of picked me circumstances. And then it was, again, that way to give back to people. And you know this, Bill, in your own recovery. I mean, there's so many people who had played a role especially that early on, right? Maybe they said something to you or they gave you a ride to a, meet, a meeting or, you know, I remember one guy, you know, early on, he, he took me fishing. He lived on a lake. He was in treatment with me. I didn't even particularly maybe like the guy. I, you know what I mean? Like, it wasn't like, hey, we were buddies, but he was like, hey, you want to go fishing next weekend? You know, and so you spend all day on a boat with somebody you get to know them and they get to know you. And, you know, those, that conversation sticks with me. And um, so anyway, it was a way for me to, to give back, you know, to all the people who'd helped me and along the way. You know, one of the things that, that happened with my mentor, Catherine, is that I had my eye on her for a while Meaning that, you know, I would meet with her biweekly and she would share some stuff with me. And at the time, cognitively, I had a lot of things going on. So not not everything that she was talking to me resonated. But but I do remember I had to go see my provider. I had to go see my case manager. I would see her there, you know, in passing in. Um, at my other appointments, I would hear other peers talk about her, um, and and I uh, I paid attention to those things. Um, and and one of the things that this might seem different, but one of the things that gave me hope was is that she was not well all the time. She struggled. And, um, but she didn't ever give up. And, and, and she announced and let people know what was going on and what was happening with her. <clears throat> and then she would be back and she would be a role model and she would be doing her thing. And, that gave me hope because at the time I thought my life was over. I had just gotten a diagnosis and there was nothing that could be done. And I was going to live with my mom and dad for the rest of my life. And, and so, so her struggle and her courage um, gave me some hope that I did not need to be perfect all the time that that I was allowed to be who I am um, and that there was a, a right and correct way about doing that by being transparent, by being open, by sharing exactly where I was at and what was going on and what was happening in my life. And, and I, think, I think that right there really resonated with me and allowed me to maybe take the next step in in becoming a peer supporter but at the time when i was observing all that and and feeling those things and processing all of that um i didn't know i was going to become a peer supporter yet either right did you know did, but did you know you were being mentored by her did you know that did you know that part um 
I kind of caught on, um, but I was like, I was like nine months to 12 years behind of where they already saw me and and where they were trying to lead me to it took a, a they they wanted to fast track me boom and i just wasn't i just didn't have the courage or the, or the confidence to do that i know in my own my own life not not that experience that i that i shared early on um when i was in the hospital but you know i i had throughout my life different mentors um <clears throat> and I didn't ever recognize what it was. Do you know what I mean? Like I didn't have the awareness of it. But when I reflect back now, you know, over the last 20 plus years of my recovery, I think, oh yeah, I had this, but it wasn't, it didn't come from the recovery world. So I didn't look at it the same, you know, it was like, and I don't know why I didn't, I didn't acknowledge it you know, they didn't have a title or, you know what I mean? It was just people who came into my life at different times and kind of mentored me along for a while. And um, so that's why I was wondering if you, you know, sometimes it's hard when we're in the middle of it to fully understand or grasp what's happening. Yeah. So, so once I, I had to, I had to actually be told before I, um, so it was a thought in my head that they were trying to get me to move in this direction, um, but I didn't really know why. So, so in Washington, where I received my mental health services, um, it, the the certification in Washington is is all done by the state, and so you have to apply to the state to take the class. You take the class, and then you know, it, it's done differently there. Um, but anyways, in the agency that she worked for, she developed a curriculum that mimicked the state. So we had to we had to commit to a a, a twelve week every Thursday and Friday for two hours and. And she took took us through the training, and then we did a mimic test that was exactly like the states, but you know she wrote her own questions and stuff. Um, and then at the end of the class, we had to do an internship of of a hundred face to face hours, and and then course and a test and and everything. And they asked me to do it, and and I declined. And my mentor, Catherine, she developed a warm line in Seattle, which is one step below the suicide hotline there because the suicide hotline is inundated with calls where people are lonely or are just having symptoms. And so I did that first, I did the peer support class because I was very careful on adding something to my plate. I had to do one thing had to become normalized where it wasn't anything extra it didn't give me any anxiety it and so i did that for six to nine months um volunteered to do the warm line and uh once that became part of my routine part of my daily thing that i would do i then did the peer supporter thing um I was like two classes behind from where they were anticipating me being. Um, and so then when I finally took the class and did that and I <clears throat> started doing my internship, of course, I got to do my internship with her and follow her around. And uh, that's when she finally like divulged, you know, this has been like 18 months in the making of it, it touched me that, you know, and these are people that believe in me and hold the hope for me and, and saw something in me that I had no idea was even there or available. Yeah. It's like, uh, it's like when you go hiking with somebody who, who's a non hiker, you don't tell them that you're going up that mountain. <laughs> you just say, you just say, come on, let's go for a hike, you know? And then you get like a couple miles in and then they go, 
oh, wow, look at that beautiful mountain, you know, I wonder what that's like, oh, oh, well, that's where we're going today, you know, like you wait until you're in, got the person and in sort of invested, otherwise it's too intimidating, you know, they go, oh my gosh, I can't go up that mountain, you know, I'm not going, yeah, that, that was clever of them, yeah. Yeah, I, I remember um, when, I, when I started uh, working as a peer supporter and, uh, you know, building this drop-in center, I, it was a really, in 2008, 2009, it was a really lonely job because there were only like six drop-in centers in the whole state. And there were just a handful of peer supporters. And it was really hard to know you know, am I doing the right thing? There was no training. There was no supervision. There was no, there was no manual. There was no peer network to call. There was no, and so it was really hard. It was hard to know, um, am I doing the right thing or what do I do in this situation? And, and I remember, uh, um, the guy, uh, John <clears throat> Watson ran the Bozeman drop-in center. And he was about six months ahead of us in building his drop-in center. So he and I became friends because we could call each other and drive over. He'd come over the hill or I'd go over there because you had to talk to somebody and say, how's it going? Like, how, you know what I mean? Like, wow, I don't know, 20 people showed up yesterday and this is what we did. And, you know, um, and it was just, it was really challenging. And then I remember going um, in late, in late 2009, I finally got to go to training. And it was a peer supporter training out of Arizona. It was, it was 14 days. Wow. And it was, it was intense. I mean, it was a lot of material. There was a lot to learn two weeks, you know, you're gone a week, and then you come home, and then you go again. And, <clears throat> but the learning was awesome, you know, and it really fired me up. But it also validated some of the stuff that I was doing that I was like, is this what I'm supposed to be doing? Because <laughs> <You know? laughs> there's nothing. It's not like, you know, like here, look through the manual, you yeah. know, like there's no manual. There's no nothing. There's mm. no, there's no one to ask. There's nobody to, you know, so um that was that that changed things for me when I went to that training and uh, you know came back. I, I did really well on the exam. I was really proud of myself for taking the time to study and learn the material and you know I scored really well to be able to come back and that really fired me up. Um, and it got me thinking about future. That was the first time I started thinking about future peer supporters. And I don't, I didn't want someone to go through what I went through to become a peer supporter and not have training and not have, you know, support around you. Like you're just, you're like out there trying to figure it all out. And so that was the first time when it was like, we need to have this for everybody. Everybody needs training. Everyone needs some support. Everyone needs some guidance, you know, and then to be able to refer back to your manual. And, and I took all that and put that into Peer Support 101 and certification. That was all a part of it. That was how it became about for me with the certification and training, because I remembered that personal experience where it was like, it was so lonely. Because you didn't, you just didn't have any guidance and what and what to do. So we have this other question: Is what has been your greatest success in deciding to become a CBHPSS? Mm. Um, and, uh, wow. So I don't know if I have a a. So I'll go back to my internship. I'm with my 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 mentor, um, and and I had clinical supervision. Um, his name was Greg Segrist. He he originated originally came from Billings, Montana, but chose to do his career in in Seattle. And so, um, my family was looking to 
moved to Montana, my mom and my dad. I'm still living with my mom and dad. Um, <clears throat> haven't been employed in over a decade. Um, and so during my internship, I would get on the internet and search Butte and Dillon and Anaconda because my brother lived in Whitehall. And, and that was kind of the location of where we were going to end up as a family. And, um, you know, Butte, Western Montana Mental Health had some peer supporter jobs posted, but they had closed. Um, and October of 2012, we co came over for vacation. Um, I had a vocational uh, specialist that I was working with. And so I got a cover letter and a resume um, and I just dropped it off there. I mean, I didn't, I had no idea what was going to happen, but January 7th, 2013, I start at Western as a peer supporter. So there's all this fear. I didn't know if, if it was going to work out. Um, and so I would have to say my greatest success that allowed me to become a certified behavior peer support specialist is that I didn't get fired. I worked myself off SSDI and and I got a routine and I got a groove. Um, but there wasn't like a moment that happened. Uh, the moment was when I successfully worked myself off SSDI and gained confidence that this is something that I could do. And you know what, Jim? I think I'm I think peer support found me. You know, I I, I wasn't like I'm going to become a peer supporter when I grow up, you know, it was a path that was offered that, I mean, I hadn't worked in a decade. Uh, my skills were diminished. Um, you know, I'd just been out there just walking the streets, literally just walking the streets. And, uh, and it gave me, it gave me a career path gave me opportunity to use that decade that I thought was a waste of time and allowed me to use it and utilize it for the benefits of others. A beautiful, beautiful thing. Yeah, well, that's so. great. That's great, Bill. That's fantastic. Well, I think that brings us to the top of the hour. Any final thoughts we want to share on I would like to personally thank each and every one of you that provide services for others. The work that we do is critical. And if peer support hadn't been given to me and someone hadn't held the hope for me, I wouldn't be where I am today. So remember that what you do matters. It's, it's important. And thank you very, very much. Thank you, peer supporters. Thank you. Bye. Recovery works and recovery is possible. Recovery works and recovery is possible. Recovery works. Recovery is possible. Recovery is possible. <laughs> recovery works and recovery is possible. Recovery works and recovery is possible. Recovery works and recovery is possible. Recovery is possible.